Gospel Luke in chapter 13 this morning. You know, one of the things that I find most amazing in the service of God is how God will work in our services. Now, there are a few that um, Luke chapter 13 this morning in verse 10 is where we're headed in just a few moments. Uh, but uh, as the schedule, the musician schedule is put together months ahead of time, my, my messages are usually uh, put together or scheduled at least four to six weeks out and begin to study. And we don't co- coordinate those two in any way. And yet my message this morning is when Jesus sees and Jesus sets you free. How Jesus cares. What a wonderful thing to see how the Lord was preparing this service, both the music and the message to speak to us this morning. Well, I hope that you've been following along in our Bible reading and on your way in or out so at some point you've picked up one of the Bible reading schedules. Today we're in Luke 13 and 14 and 15 and how many wonderful truths that we learn in here. But in this passage we are introduced to a lady that we see nowhere else in the scripture. A time that Jesus, we don't know the, the name of the town where Jesus was, We don't know the name of this woman, but one day Jesus came to her, we'll call it her church, her synagogue, showed up on that Saturday for that service as Jesus was preaching and teaching the word of God, and Jesus saw her, and Jesus cared. If you'll stand with me this morning out of respect and reverence to God's word, we'll read this passage of scripture, you follow along, we're going to start our reading in verse 10 to give the context and then down several verses to see what God does here. Notice with me in the gospel of Luke chapter 13 and verse 10, and he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath day, and we'll explain the significance of that in a moment, and behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity, 18 years, and was bowed together and could in no wise lift herself up. When Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loosed from thy infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. Oh, my friends, when Jesus sets us free, what a wonderful day that is. I don't know about you, friend, but I remember the day that Jesus set me free. But not everyone's happy when God is moving. Notice with me in verse 14, the Bible says, And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation, because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day, and said unto the people, There are six days in which men ought to work, and in them therefore come and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. Like you can just show up any day of the week, and Jesus is going to show up and heal you of an 18-year disease. All right, That just doesn't happen every day. And the Lord answered him and said, Thou hypocrite. Listen, friend, the Lord knows and he sees our hearts. Friends, listen, don't be bothered. Don't be put out. Don't be disturbed when people aren't happy when God's doing great things. You just keep serving God. If it happened to Jesus, it'll happen to us. Doth not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead them away to watering? Ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, notice here Jesus links her physical infirmity to his spiritual cause, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these 18 years, and be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? And when they heard these things, all his adversaries were ashamed, and all the people rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. Oh, my friend, what a wonderful day when Jesus sets us free. Let's ask God's help this morning. Father, we thank you for this tremendous passage. Thank you, Lord, for every verse in the Bible. Thank you, Lord, for this specific chapter. And Lord, these specific verses, Lord, found no other place in the Bible. Thank you, Father, for this wonderful record of how, Lord, your son made such a difference on this day to this woman's life. And so, Father, bless us, Lord, as we study this passage. I pray, Lord, you would challenge our hearts, Lord, in Jesus' name. And amen. I think you may be seated this morning. I have, as we have been preaching through this series of messages in coordination with our Bible reading, I was, I was intrigued. I was intrigued as I received an email this week uh, on the significance of Bible reading. 
And maybe you've been here and you've been in and out and you're like, well, you know, Pastor, I, I don't know that I have time to read a chapter a day or I don't know that I have time to read three chapters a day. And, and, and you know, you're busy and I'm busy. I understand that. We all have things to do and responsibilities. But I was, I was, uh, I was intrigued. I knew this to be true personally, but it was interesting to see it quantitatively. It's interesting, there was a, a joint research put on uh, by two different PhD uh, uh, research, and, and they engaged 40 different people. I, they, listen, I can give you a copy of this. It's not just something Pastor Rob made up. They took a control study of 40,000 people in America between the ages of 8 and 80. I think that's a good spread. Amen. How many of you here are uh, between the ages of 8 and 80? Raise your hand. All right. We have several of you that are over 80, and we're just going to grace you into the study. Now. 40,000 people. And they asked certain people, they said, listen, why don't you read the Bible? Would you commit to reading the Bible one day a week? They said, we can do that one day a week. And then, then they said to the, the, the next group, two days a week, and then three days a week. And they found people that would read it, this is one day a week, two days a week, three days a week, four days a week, all the way up to seven days a week. And this is what they found after a, they came back to them after a, a period of time to allow that spiritual discipline to set in. And this is what they found. They found that the people that read it just the Bible one day a week and they surveyed them on different areas of their life, they didn't see much difference. And then two days and then three days. But it's interesting, when they, when they hit four days and above of consistent Bible reading, this shocked me. When they, when they found the people, when they surveyed and got everything back and they called all the data, they put it together. Those people that were willing to commit to just reading the Bible four out of the seven days a week, they found this. They, their feelings of being lonely dropped by 30%. Their anger issues dropped by 32%. Their bitterness in relationships dropped by 40%. Their dependence on alcohol and drugs dropped by 57%. They're falling into temptations of sin dropped by 70%. Fee, uh, viewing of pornography dropped by 61%. Sharing their faith jumped 200%. And being involved in helping others jumped 230%. Can I just tell you, friend, you, are, you may be asking, Pastor, what's in it for me? Pastor, why should I, why should I get one of those little yellow sheets of paper? And why should I follow along and, and commit to reading three chapters of the Bible a day? Because listen, friend, it's not just an exercise in religion. It's not just about being a, a, quote, good Christian. Listen, understand that you are a whole you. Your body, your soul, your spirit are all a part of you. And listen, friend, we all struggle. We struggle with temptation. We struggle with doubt. We struggle with loneliness. We struggle with uh, struggles. We struggle with those temptations. But listen, the word of God, listen, let God teach you and help you and strengthen you by his wonderful, glorious word. Interesting, a, a preacher from many, many years ago was asked this. You might, have heard, you might have heard his name, Charles Spurgeon, a very f famous pastor from years gone by. And somebody said, uh, Pastor Spurgeon, uh, what, what's more important, reading the Bible or praying? That's a good question. That's a wonderful question. What, well, what is more important? If I, we only have so many hours in a day, so much time to do anything. And, and he, he thought on a minute, and his, his prayerful answer was this. Well, what's more important, breathing in or breathing out? And that's truly what Bible reading and prayer represent. When we breathe the Bible, listen, God breathes into us spiritual nourishment and encourage, encouragement. And when we pray, listen, we breathe out in prayer to God. I believe we would all agree. To, how many agree it's important to breathe in and breathe out? Say amen. 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 Listen, friend, I want to encourage you. If you've not yet, listen, we're only, this is uh, day number, this is January. What is it, we have 21 today? January 21? Can you believe January is almost halfway, over halfway over? I can't believe it. Somebody needs to slow down 2024. I am not done, all right? I am not done with week one of January, let alone week three. But listen, if you've not started, if you've not gotten on board, if you've not said, listen, I'm going to commit this year, this is the year I'm going to read the Bible every day. Every day I'm going to let God speak to me. Friend, listen, this is not just a pastor. I, I'm not just trying to, listen, I don't get paid a bonus for how many people get signed up to read their Bible. Friend, I am trying to connect you to the God who's connected me. Listen, I know how much God has helped me and how much God has healed me and how much God has strengthened me and certainly how much God has changed me as I have, as I have allowed him to work in my life. So with all of that saying, 
I would encourage you to go home to read today and read Luke 13 and 14 and 15. You'll find so many wonderful truths. But in Luke chapter 13 this morning, we're introduced to this lady. Now let's look a little bit about this uh, about this lady. Well, well, first of all, back up before then, let's get the setting. Uh, God always gives us little nuggets of where they are and what, what, what things are going on. I want you to notice with me here, look at chapter 13, Genesis, uh, Luke chapter 13, and I want us to get the context. Where is Jesus? What's going on? And the Bible says, there were some present at that season that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. It was a terrible situation, and and the question was, Lord, listen, these people, they had a bad thing happen to them. Is it because they were bad? And Jesus said, no, listen, bad things happen to all kinds of people, good things and bad people. Very dangerous to start uh, uh, taking situations and circumstances and try to say, hmm, I wonder why that happened. That's what Jesus was trying to deal with. But he was in Galilee. These Galileans were sharing with him some news while he was gone. Now notice with me where he was going. Drop your reading down uh, uh, to verse, let's see here. Uh, let's see here, uh, 22, verse 22. The Bible says, is it, and when he had went through the cities and villages, teaching and journeying towards, where church? Journeying towards Jerusalem. So he's in Galilee and he's traveling south from town to town and, and village to village. And, and little, from the villages are little places, cities are big places. And he, he's going on Saturday to Saturday, so Sabbath to Sabbath, to the synagogue to synagogue and teaching. His, and you know what, he's going from Galilee to Calvary. I want you to get the point here. Jesus is on his way to the cross. What would Jesus do when he got to Jerusalem? When he got to Jerusalem at this point in his ministry, listen, he was headed to Calvary. He was headed to the cross. Listen, friend, I want you to notice as he as Jesus was headed to the cross, he was not too busy to stop and help people. I notice there, notice with me in verse 10, the Bible says, and he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years, was bound together and could in no wise lift herself up. The first thing that I was impressed with or the things that jumped out at me at this passage was this. It was the Sabbath day and Jesus was in the synagogue. If we were to say it today, it was the Lord's day and he was in the Lord's house. Now listen, you and I, we can't imitate some of the things that Jesus did. All right, how many of you guys have ever tried and failed at walking on water? Anybody in here? All right. If you try, you will fail. You know why? You're not Jesus. All right. I hope you never tried. I've never gone into a nursing home and, and gone up to a dead person in the casket and say, uh, arise and be healed. I've never done that. That's a good thing because I'm not Jesus. All right. It's not going to happen. I've never laid my hands on somebody that can't see or, 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 or healed somebody. Listen, if you can heal somebody, go to the children, go down to DeVos Hospital and clean it out. All right, that'd be the greatest thing. And the faith healers, the squealers, feelers, and healers, you tell them to go to the divorced children's hospital, you clean it out, and then we'll get an idea that you're from God. All right? Now, we can't imitate all of that. But what we can do is we can be in the Lord's house on the Lord's day. You say, Pastor, how can we be like Jesus? Well, listen, you can't do some things like Jesus did, but you can do other things like Jesus. Listen, it was the Lord's day, and he was in the Lord's house. The Lord was faithful on the Lord's day to be in the Lord's house. And by the way, he just didn't show up and sit down and enjoy the service. The Bible says he would get the book and he would read as he was wont to do. What's that mean? It was his custom. It was his habit. Jesus showed up to the church house to serve. Now it's interesting. We see here in in verse uh, verse 11 that there was a woman in that great congregation that had gathered together. There was this very specific woman. The Bible doesn't give us her name. But God gives us some information about her. The Bible says that uh, she, was, uh, she had a spirit of infirmity. What does that mean? Well, go over with me now in verse, uh, look at verse 16. Jesus explains that. He says, ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these 18 years, loose from this bond on the Sabbath day? The Bible says, listen, there, there was a spiritual affliction that she was suffering. The devil ha- had begun to, listen, uh, afflict her physically. And please understand, it. you may not agree with this, but you don't have to agree with the Bible. You can be wrong. That's okay. Uh, but listen, uh, there are things, listen, in our life, listen, sometimes we get sick. We live in a world that's full of sin, right? We, live, we, we have bodies that are cursed by the curse of sin. Listen, we get sick. We get tired. In fact, I was on the uh, phone texting many different men and women last night and uh, today, this morning, just reaching out to them. And they're, they're letting us know to pray for them. Listen, it happens. But in the Bible, listen. God clearly says sometimes there are things that, are, that, that, that come out physically and mentally, emotionally, that listen, that, that have a spiritual 
cause. A spiritual root cause to them. And let, let me just say here, I'm thankful for doctors. I'm thankful for medicines. Listen, I've, I've broken so many bones in my body. I've, got, uh, I've had enough stitches to have railroad tracks. I'm thankful for the medicine and the doctors especially. But listen, sometimes, sometimes we're trying to medicate a problem that's not physical. It's spiritual. We need to understand that sometimes in our life, that there, whether it's our emotions, our, our spirit, our body, that sometimes that physical things and emotional things come because there's a spiritual problem. You say, what do, you, what do I do with that, Pastor? You go to Dr. Jesus. He's the great physician. Listen, I'm not telling you not to go to the doctor. Go to the doctor. I'm not telling you to, to, to go to the emergency room. You go to the emergency room. But listen, on the way, you better pray to Dr. Jesus and ask him, Lord, if there's something that's spiritual in this, Lord, would you help me? And Lord, would you heal me? And we see this here. Now, it's interesting. This lady had been sick for 18 years. How many think that's a long time? That's a long time. How many of our teenagers are 18 years, specifically 18? Anybody that's specifically 18? Nobody's specifically 18 in our teen department. Listen, you just hang on a few more years. You'll get there. I know most of you are just, you're close. You're real close. 18 years is a long time. I would imagine on any given day, the Bible says she was bent over. She was bent over and she was locked in this position. And she could not in no wise straighten herself up. I imagine her back hurt. I imagine she was terribly embarrassed. I imagine she went to bed sore and tired and hurting every day. I imagine she got out of bed and listen, she ached and agonized every single day of her life. But listen, one thing that impresses me, and I'm sure it touched the heart of the Savior, was listen, she didn't let it stop her from being faithful to God. Now, please understand, I'm going to give a disclaimer. I get more flack and feedback on Facebook. When I put anything about being faithful, you get pastor, what about this, what about that? All right, if you're sick, you're sick. Don't come to church sick. If you're in the hospital, stay in the hospital. I understand, we work in a 24-7 uh, world. Some, of, some people have to work. There are people, the good, faithful men that I've texted this morning that are not able to be here because they're homesick. That's fine. Stay home if you're sick. All right, I understand, but listen, this lady, please understand, I'm not talking about that when I'm on Facebook. I'm saying, listen, if you just don't feel like it, you want to be home in your bunny slippers rather than being in God's house, listen, friend, what if this lady would have decided, I just don't feel like it, I'm not going today. Listen, I can tell you, you don't know what service will change your life, but you can mark down, friend, it will not be the service you decide to stay home. It might have been the one service that you, listen, 18 years. I don't know if this lady had been faithful every service, but what if it was this one Saturday, this one Sabbath, this one service that she said, you know what, I'm too tired, I'm too sick, I'm too sore. Why? I keep going, I keep going, I keep going, and nothing ever happens. Listen, the one service she would have missed would have been the one service that, listen, that would have changed her life. Friend, I don't know what service is going to change your life. I don't know what message, I don't know what day the Holy Spirit's going to shinny up next to you and change your life. But friend, it won't be the service you miss. I thank God, listen, in my home, growing up, uh, 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 listen, there, uh, we were old school, all right? There was the parents and there were the children. And the children didn't tell the parents what to do. And as long as I was, I was 19 years old, I was graduated from high school, working a full-time job and going to engineering college. And listen, my mother said, listen, if you're listening under my house, under my roof, eating my food, you're going to my church. And I'll never forget sitting way back there about where Miss Becky is on a hot July day. And I sat there with my arms folded, just daring God and the Holy Spirit to to just break this hard, stony heart. And let me tell you something, it was one hot uh, July day that God moved in and touched my heart. And listen, broke my spirit. And listen, changed my life. I thank God. I thank God I was in church that day. I notice here, the Lord was in the Lord's house on the Lord's day. I noticed the faithfulness of this very afflicted woman. But I noticed this, the very compassionate Savior. Notice with me, the Bible says in verse 12, and when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. You see, there was two components to this dear lady's problem. Number one, she had a spiritual problem. That spiritual problem then manifests itself in a physical problem. Jesus first dealt with the the first part, the most important part, the spiritual part. In loosing her, he released her from the affliction, the oppression of the devil. Then we notice he goes on in verse 12. 
in the, or I'm sorry, in verse 13. And, and he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. It's an interesting thing. I just want to pause and make a side note here. The, phys- the, the, the gospel writer Luke was a physician. He was a doctor by trade and training. He often includes many of the miracles that the Lord did I believe as a physician, it fascinated him. Listen, as a doctor, I'm sure he was frustrated at how many people had come to him. And he was unable to help with the limited means that he had. But it absolutely not only validated, but thrilled his heart to see, for him to see what Jesus could do that no one else can do. Not only did he include many of the miracles Jesus did, but it's also interesting that uh, this physician also included many and much of the ministry that Jesus had to women, to ladies that were in and around him. Listen, can I say Jesus had a tremendous ministry, not only to men and to the multitudes, but to many women as well. Listen, Jesus spoke to women. Jesus included women. Jesus did not degrade women. Jesus valued women and, and their ministry and their contributions to his, to his ministry. Jesus was always very appropriate with women. And Jesus, listen, he healed and he helped and he saved many women. If you were just looking at the few chapters that surround this chapter, not even looking at the whole Gospel of Luke, you see many times Jesus, he, 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 he was asked to come heal a little, a little girl. And Jesus stopped what he's doing. He, he went and healed a little girl. On the way, there was a lady and she had an issue of blood. And she, listen, she, he, she touched the hem of his garment, was healed. And listen, over and over, Jesus had a, a ministry to ladies. Ladies, can I just say, you're not a second-class citizen. Ladies, you're not a second-class Christian. Can I say to you today that Jesus loves you, he sees you, he cares about you. Listen, he knows the specific and and very uh, uh, specific burdens and and things that are in your life and in your heart and the challenges you face. I notice three things here in our passage. First of all, went so long with that, well with that song, thank you Miss Rachel. First of all, Jesus noticed. The Bible says, notice with me here, in verse and when Jesus saw her. Now understand, there's a crowd of people in, the, in that synagogue. And they were all packed together. I mean, if you knew Jesus was showing up, let me tell you something. It would be seating room only. We'd have the choir law full. We'd have chairs down the aisle. Listen, when Jesus showed up, a crowd always showed up. But in that crowd, in that multitude with all of those people, Jesus saw, listen, her. Many times we go through life and you say, does anybody see me? Does anybody, does anybody care? Maybe you're a single lady, maybe you're a widow, maybe you've never been married, maybe you're a mom struggling with the kids at home. Maybe you're some point, some place in your life and you're really wondering, does anybody care? Does anybody see me? Let me just tell you something. Jesus sees. Let me just encourage all of us, make an application of this. Listen, friend, Jesus was on his way to Calvary. Jesus was on his way to the cross. Now, if you were on the way to your cross, where you're going to be whipped, stripped, you're going to be, uh, they're going to beat a crown of thorns in your head. They're going to buffet you and rip your beard out. The Bible says he was marred more than any man. He could, his, it was literally so marred and so brutalized. He didn't even look like a human being on the cross. That's what Jesus was going to. And yet Jesus saw this one woman. Do we take time to see? Yes, we have burdens. Yes, we have battles. Yes, we have bummers in our life. We have all of those things and listen, we're busy and and we're so preoccupied. But listen, do we really see people? Jesus saw people. Number two, not only did Jesus see, but he cared. He cared. See, it's different from just seeing people. Oh, poor lady going on with my life wonder what we're having what time's preacher going to get done what's for lunch where are we going to we're going to go to arby's we're going to go to right oh that poor poor soul that feel bad for them Mm, too bad okay what's next you see it's one thing to see it's another thing to care jesus didn't just see jesus 
care. The Bible says here, and Jesus saw her, and he called her unto him. I can just see Jesus parting the crowd. Hey, this lady right here. Yes, this sick lady that, that you shoved to the back. This sick lady that everybody feels bad for, but nobody does anything with. Yes, everybody spread apart. Would you come here? And then he said, Thou art woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. Jesus knows. Jesus sees. Jesus cares. And Jesus knows. He knows that burden that only you know. That thing when you lay your head on the pillow at night and only you you, you and God know about, he knows. Not only does Jesus see and he cares and he helps, he, he called, he cared, but he helped. Jesus took time to help and to heal this woman. Friend, I want to challenge all of us today. Number one, let's, let's be more serious in 2024 about seeing those who need to be seen. Number two, let's, let's take more time and be very intentional about caring. Do you know we had, I believe it was 13 family members in here that lost family members last year? 13 people at Rose Park. I just out of our church family, 13 people in our membership passed away and went to heaven. That means there's 13 families in here that has an empty seat right next to them. And their heart is aching. Let's see it. Let's care. And let's do something about it. Let's help. Jesus took time not only to see and to care, but Jesus helped. Now, listen, we, we can't do what Jesus did, but we can do what we can do. You can go up to somebody, and now I'm going to use this illustration. You don't have, I can go, hi, I'm Rob. Now, if you go up to them and say, hi, I'm Rob, and you're not Rob, it's going to be awkward. Okay, all right. So you put your name in there, all right, whatever your name is, all right. Hi, I'm so-and-so. I was blessed two weeks ago with a family a new family visiting family over here said, hey, we'll save you a seat. You know what? They did what they could. Why don't you introduce yourself? Why, why don't we look around and see who's sitting by themselves? Friends, if someone's sitting by themselves because they want to, that's fine. But if someone's sitting by themselves because no one's sitting by them, that's a problem. Why don't you invite someone to sit with you? Maybe that single lady, maybe that single man. Let's be very appropriate, of course. This is not the Rose Park dating game, all right? <clears throat> We're not playing Matchmaker International here, all right? Let's be very appropriate. Ladies, maybe you need to give a lady a hug. Men, maybe you need to give that guy a bear hug. Give him a fist bump. Why don't we begin to do something? I don't know what you can do, but I can say hi. I can ask him how they're doing. I can pray for them. I maybe write their name down or their number or give them my phone number and say, hey, you need a prayer, uh, text me where it's appropriate, of course. I always have ladies text my wife. I always text men. Just keep it appropriate. But Jesus made a difference. Friend, I notice here, and I'll close with this. What's the, what's the response of those who've been touched? I love this, what the Bible says here. And the Bible says, and she was made straight in verse 13. And what did she do, church? glorified God. You know, this lady is a wonderful picture of each one of us. So all of us here in, in one of two conditions. This, this spiritual infirmity is a picture of sin. This lady was bound up in sin. And maybe you've come today, listen, and maybe you're still bound up in sin. You've never been saved. Jesus has never set you free from being bound up under the slavery of sin. And that's what sin is. And the devil has the shackles of you and is, is just chuckling and enjoying the fact that it's going to send you to hell. Listen today, the wonderful news I can share today is Jesus can set you free. If you've come today and you're not sure you're on your way to heaven, friend, you come to the right place at the right time because Jesus can set you free. But listen, this message just doesn't apply to those who've never trusted Christ as their Savior, never become a Christian. Listen, there's a lot of Christians when Dr. Jesus puts on his spiritual glasses, he sees a lot of spiritually sick Christians. A lot of Christians who are doubled over 
and bound up in a lot of sick sin. People doing things and going things and vaping things and smoking things and watching things and scrolling things. And they're all bound up in that sin. And they're all, listen, helpless to be set free. That's what sin does. That's why Jesus hates it. That's why you ought to hate it too. Christian, if you're here this morning, and if Jesus would put on his spiritual x-ray vision glasses and look at you, would he see a sin-sick soul all doubled up in sin? Then why don't we go to Jesus today and ask him to set us free? Let's bow our heads this morning with heads bowed and eyes closed. This morning, if you're here today and you've never personally trusted the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior, can I ask you and just encourage you, that's the greatest decision you can make. Say, Pastor, what does that mean and what is it? It is simply this, that you will recognize that you are a sinner and you need a Savior. There's no magic words, no magic formula. It is to understand that you are guilty and on your way to hell and he is the sinless Christ that can set you free. You say, Pastor, I, I want that, I need that. And this morning, before you leave, please, as we're in just a few moments going to play uh, uh, some music, uh, an invitation to slip out of your pew and come down. If you're a man, a man will take a Bible and show you how you can know for sure you're on your heaven. A lady will take the Bible and show you for sure how you can be on your way to heaven. Christian, maybe you're here this morning, and you know as Jesus is looking at you, he sees a soul that's all bound up by the Satan's sin. And maybe it's some addiction, maybe it's some habit. Maybe it's some fault. Maybe it's some stronghold. Let's run to Jesus today. Let's stand this morning with heads bowed and eyes closed as the instruments begin to play a